Welcome to Sheboygan County Government, working for you. My name is Adam Payne, Sheboygan County Administrator and co-host of this program with Chairman Bill Gehring. And today we're very pleased to have a face on the program that you haven't seen before, at least not on this program, our new Highway Commissioner, Greg Schnell. Greg, welcome. Thanks for having me. Greg, I think, has been with us now for three, four months. I started October 2nd. And has a tremendous amount of responsibility associated with the Highway Department. and. As you know, it is the season, the roads can get slick, and Greg's gonna give an overview of his roles and responsibilities as well as uh, share some of the challenges and new projects that are up and coming. Greg, please begin by sharing a little bit about yourself and your background. Well, as you stated, Adam, I'm, I'm new into the position. October 2nd was when I started. Um, my wife's name is Cheryl, I have two kids, Natalie and Mac, uh, 11 and, and seven. We reside in the uh, village of Howard's Grove. Um, the position of Highway Commissioner in Sheboygan County is some days challenging, but most days rewarding. Um, I have an excellent staff to work with. Um, Adam's been a great uh, advocate in my corner, and, and so has the Transportation Committee. Um, the biggest challenge so far I've seen is, is getting to know the roads and, and the employees. There's quite a few of them, so uh, that's what I'll be working on throughout the winter months here. And you, it's nice that you touched on your family and where you're living, but. Uh... Obviously, you've got a lot of great experience, and that's why you were hired. You worked over in Manitowoc County. What were some of your responsibilities there? As I started, I was a, a bulldozer operator and uh, worked my way through the ranks, took some night classes uh, in the interim, and uh, progressed into a, a position of road superintendent and spent uh, the last seven years at the highway department um, uh, estimating jobs and, and uh, scheduling the workforce and, and working on budgetary issues with uh, the highway commissioner there. So folks watching the program, you know, when they hear we're talking about the highway department, they may think it's rather intuitive what the highway department is all about. But in a nutshell, what are the key responsibilities of your department? Um, the key responsibilities, I believe, would be uh, providing the safe and, and reliable transportation that we do perform here in, in uh, Sheboygan County, not only just to the taxpayers, but to the people that are going through. Obviously, we have... Uh, uh, I-43 that goes through the, to the, through the county and, and carries probably anywhere from 30 to 40,000 cars a day. And um, also the businesses in, in Sheboygan County rely on their goods and services to, be, uh, get, to get there at a, at a reasonable amount of time. So um, it is a huge responsibility and, and um, I believe that uh, from what I've seen so far in the short time I've been here is that uh, it's been managed very well to this point and, and we continue, we'd like to continue to do that way. So first impressions have been pretty good. Yes, they have. How many employees do you have? We have currently 114 employees, 104 of which are represented by the union. Uh, we have a staff consisting of in the office with administrative assistant, a bookkeeper. Um, we have the, um, our accountant, some engineer, and two, uh, two road superintendents. They are responsible for taking care of the road construction and maintenance projects throughout the county. We also have a, a, a county engineer who has a, a surveyor that works with him also. And um, uh, let's see, I probably missed somebody, but uh, as we go through, we'll, and we have a shop superintendent also. Uh, our highway shops consist of, we have six district sheds, which also have a supervisor stationed at each one. And these gentlemen are, are responsible for a crew of men to take care of the maintenance that, that needs to get taken care of on a daily basis. So $15 million budget, that number I happen to remember. <laughs> 114 staff and uh, as you said responsible for road maintenance but also responsible for re repair new roads what what are some of the you know specific tasks that these folks are doing out there we uh, Sheboygan County is, is is not unique but in, in a certain instance it is that we do have our asphalt plant we're one of eight counties out of the 72 that has an asphalt plant besides having a crusher so not only do we do the road construction, but we make the products to complete these projects. And we do that all of our, with ourselves. We have our own paver, we have our, our trucking. Um, we take care of the construction from ground up. We build the road. Um, it's, uh, it, it's a great thing to have. It's cost savings to the taxpayers. And, and I believe it's, um, it's, it's fortunate to have that type of, of equipment and diversity in the highway department. I know it's been real cost effective for us and you've been uh Obviously, you're working with municipalities that Chairman Gehring is going to talk about in a moment, but just how many roads do we have out there that, that we're maintaining? We're responsible. The, the, the county highway system is established with 450 miles. We also are responsible for the state highways at 170 miles, plus we take care of 
465 miles of local township roads, the townships and villages that we, we take care of. So it's a lot of road and you know that's not counting all of them because there is a few townships and villages that have their own equipment that take care of themselves but uh, it's a lot of stuff to do. So when that snow or sleet does come and folks are wondering why my road hasn't been hit yet they might want to remember exactly just how many roads we have out there to to maintain and take care of and that takes some time. Exactly. Well I think that's a pretty good overview I'll turn it over to Bill. Okay. Greg, in addition to being County Board Chairman you know I'm Chairman of the Town of Sherman and the county really does a lot of work for other municipalities. How do you coordinate all that work with towns, villages, and the state work you have to do? The state maintenance uh, basically is, is, we have a manual that we follow, and it kind of gives us guidelines that are established by the state. Um, in the interim, we do have a state representative that comes down once a week and rides with one of the superintendents, and we, we overview their roads to see what the needs are. Um, if there's things that are getting overlooked or uh, should be taken care of, um, they will tell us what direction we should take on that kind of stuff. Um, as far as our, our outlying sheds or our district sheds, um, a lot of our sh shed supervisors will speak to the town chairman or the town employee that's responsible for the roads themselves and they will uh, coordinate the patching or the brush cutting or whatever is the need that, that, that they're looking for, It'd be it ditching or uh, even shouldering for that matter. So it's, it's coordinated through a, a commutative effort as far as from the chairman or the town worker to the shed supervisor, and we all work together on that. If there's something, a, a bigger asphalt project that would need to be taken care of, we provide an estimate or provide the material and the equipment in order to take care of that job. Okay. I've always thought that there's really a benefit to the taxpayer, both to the local town taxpayer and the larger county taxpayer, to have that coordination. Can you speak to that issue? Well, it, it's, it's effective as far as time management. Um, if you had to go to the outside and, and try to uh, hire a contractor, a lot of them are either tied up and you may have to wait for a fair amount of time in order to get the project completed that you want to in a short time, especially if it's, it, you know, and it could be a, uh, an emergency type situation with culvert pipes and different things like that that need to be uh, taken care of right away. The, the cost benefit to, um, to having having the highway department taking care of your maintenance and your snow plowing um, would, would come down to where we own the snow plows, you contract us. You don't have to have a building to house that equipment. You don't have to purchase the salt to take care of the ice. Um, you don't have to have the employees to, to do it. You just contract somebody out to do it and we have the equipment and the, the know-how and the expertise to get it done in a timely fashion. And that's where the, the cost effectiveness, it's mm -hmm. called shared services. And I think that's what we, uh, a lot of us are looking for to the future because it is getting expensive to purchase and, and to uh, buy that equipment and the materials needed. And, and if we keep the stuff going that we have and, and find more beneficial uses for it, the, more, the better off we are. Great, great. Adam mentioned already, I believe that your budget is $15 million. Can you talk a little bit about What's comprised of that budget? How much of that budget do we spend on snow removal in the average year? Just in looking back at some of the past um, history, obviously I've only been here for a short <laughs> month, so I'm trying to pull as much out as I right. can. Um, it, it evolves to about close to $2 million, just shy of $2 million. And out of that $2 million comes the um, purchase of the snowplow blades and the salt and the snow fencing and all that stuff that goes gets into winter in order to take care of business when, it, when, when the storms do hit. Um, you know, salt alone, uh, we purchase just for the county use alone is about 11,000 tons. Um, so you're looking at well, over $300,000 just in salt alone. Uh, so it does take a fair amount of money to keep the roads bare and at the end of winter you really don't see, you know, whereas you, when you asphalt the road and you spend $200,000 you see the asphalt and it's going to be there for many years to come, the salt is washed away. So it's, uh, and it's a coordination effort, you know, there's uh, ways that we can, um, you know, depending upon the storm and timing of going out, you know, there's ways that we can save salt also. If we time the storm right and every storm is different, but you know, snow has different consistencies and a lot of times it's going to take more salt to get some off and less salt to get others off. And, uh, if we work with Mother Nature, a lot of times we'll be able to, we can time it where we can save salt and benefit, save money. We've been fairly lucky this winter, haven't had too many major snowfalls, but what type of equipment, how many trucks do we put out for, say, a one to two inch snowfall? 
and what would be the cost of cleaning up a one to two inch snowfall? We run, in a typical one to two inch snowfall, we'll run 40 trucks with the blades on the front with a wing. Um, that cost, depending upon, again, the, 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 the si style of snow that would come, heavy, wet, windy, uh, it all factors into it, we could be looking at $60,000 at a normal basis. That's not counting overtime and all that. So the, the, uh, the timing is everything. If it's a weekend, it's gonna be a lot more expensive of the snow than it is during the week because the guys are here already. So it's, it's the consistency of snow, the timing of it, and then what's gonna happen after. Normally when we get snow around here, we get a bunch of wind that follows it. So the snow that just was in the ditch on one day, it's gonna blow across and cause problems for us in the, in the rest of the week. So it depends upon the timing. Just, but $60,000 is a pretty good bet. Okay, what are the normal working hours? Obviously you have to call workers out at all hours, but what are the normal working hours of the highway department crews? Our normal working hours in the winter are 7 to 3.30. Um, we, in the winter months, we put out a second shift, which starts at 3 o'clock and works to 11.30. And then we have a third shift that comes in and works from 11.30 to 7.30, I believe the hours are. Uh, they consist of two men per shift, and it consists of, they stay pretty much on I-43 and 23, uh, two of the main thoroughfares into Sheboygan. Uh, and it's basically by state DOT uh, request. They want 24-hour coverage, so we provide that um, throughout the week. It's a great benefit. Um, we can see uh, uh, benefits in that early morning when the, um, when the traffic's starting to flow about 5 o'clock up the interstate. Uh, we need to be applying salt. If, and, and if you would start at your normal time, if let's just say we call the guys in at 4 o'clock, they wouldn't be able to make that first round in order to get that salt applied and, and get it working so that the traffic can move at a, at a decent speed and, and get to their destination that they, they want to. Are we still working 10 hour days during the summer? Or? Yes, we are. Um, we uh, start Memorial Day and the Monday after Memorial Day, or yeah, Monday after Memorial Day and can, uh, stop at Labor Day. So those in that short time, we worked a four 10 hour schedule, which is a benefit to us. Um, when you have to go out and set up as much traffic control as we do, if we did it in an eight hour shift, we'd lose probably an hour at least uh, in the morning and, and probably half hour at night in order to establish that traffic control. This way in a 10 hour day, you're still getting a good you know, nine hours of work and getting your traffic control and everything taken care of. Okay. Then finally, do you have any tips for winter drivers so that they might help the, the plows and not hinder them as the plows go down the road? Well, you know, the further back you stay, the better off you are. And we can see a lot better that way and, and know where you are. Um, it's a lot of truck to be moving around. But just to back up, you know, in, in preparation of winter, I think that the first things that people should do in the winter months in the fall is secure their mailbox tightly to the post. Well, we do not hit them on purpose. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's one of those calls that we, we don't like to get. And I'll tell you, when you have 11 foot wing hanging off the side of a truck, it's a lot to control. So. Um, it's not something that we like to do, but it does happen. So secure the post and then the mailbox tight to it, the first thing. And all winter long, just give our guys space so that we can back up and see. Passing a plow, which is, I think, illegal now, um, you know, prepare for the whiteout condition. And that, and that can cause lots of problems. You might not know, but is it also illegal on a four-lane highway to pass a plow? To your knowledge? During, during the event, I believe it is. Okay. When, there's, when you're in a cleanup situation, when the plow is, is, can be off to the side of the road, um, it is allowable. But the, the, the legal uh, distance to stay back is 200 feet. Um, I'd also like to mention, you know, along with them, 40 vehicles. And when we get to larger storms, we do have um, 12 uh, graders and 18 Oshkosh trucks. Oshkosh trucks are the big ones that move a lot of snow and they're all uh, four-wheel drive and uh, they're basically designed just for snow. There is no other operation for them. So uh, it, uh, it's a lot of iron to go out and, and push snow back. So. Okay, well, I appreciate that clarification on passing the snowplow even on a four-lane. Yep. I've learned something. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Now back to those mailboxes because it's that time of year and you're right not only to have them secured fast, uh, you know, secured well because they may be hit, you know, obviously the guys try to avoid that, but I've noticed of late living on a county road that even when you come by, if they don't hit the mailbox, just the force of that snow coming off the wing and hitting that mailbox sometimes can just cave those sure. boxes right in. 
as you can imagine, you know, if the plow is going, you know, and, and usually the, the speed uh, for the first round in the morning when the guys are just cleaning up the first, the first path and applying the salt on their way back, the second one is when we start picking up the slush from the salt that was applied first. And if they're going a little bit over 35 miles an hour, at the end of that wing, it's coming off there a lot faster. Sure. So it, it does cause, we don't hit them most of the time, it's mostly the snow that, that causes the problem. And back to the tips for a little bit, you mentioned that, you know, some safety concerns with give these folks some space and, you know, be careful if you're going to pass and that type of thing. But what if someone comes upon an intersection or an area or a low spot in a road where they just, it's icy, it's dangerous, they can see salt hasn't come through yet or they, they see the same spot kind of reoccurring. What's your advice to how they get that information to the appropriate party and, and get it dealt with sooner rather than later? You can call, um, if it's on an off-hour basis, you can call the Sheriff's Department. We have people on call 24 hours a day, and uh, we'll go and, and take care of it, view it first, you know, mm -hmm. to see if, if there is anything that we can do. Um, in, in a lot of snowfalls, um, there is some cases where uh, it's slippery, but we do not want to apply salt. And the reason being is that salt turns everything to liquid. If the snow is blowing across, it creates more hard pack and more ice every time we get it wet and we can't control the wind. Mm. So it's, um, we're not doing it just to make people go in a ditch or make sure our jobs are secure. It's because we don't, after, after you apply that salt, your cleanup gets a lot more expensive because you'll probably need to bring in other pieces of equipment to help cut that off uh, by graders and, and other pieces. So it's, um, like I said before, it's not brain surgery, but there is a fair amount of thought that goes into each and every storm and how things are going to operate, temperatures and all that stuff, and what's going to happen after. You know, More of an art than a science. Yes, it is. Very good. Well, you've talked about some of the important maintenance responsibilities that the department has, and obviously from the winter snow removal and dealing with the ice and road conditions to just the maintenance that happens throughout the year. And you briefly touched on some of the work that your crews need to do when they're out there actually improving the roads, putting another overlay on, what have you. And I know you weren't here for most of 2006, although you've uh, clearly come up to speed real quickly. What were some of the, the major projects in the past year that uh, where roads were improved throughout the county? We did County Trunk V, um, and I, I, I'm not sure of the, uh, the distance was 2.4 miles. It was a complete reconstruction. Um, we recut the ditches and re-sloped everything and rebuilt the base with aggregate and then laid the, uh, the binder mat of asphalt on and in, in 2007 now we'll put the top finish coat on. Um, we had some major projects over at the airport with a hangar. Um, I'm not real familiar with that job that was complete by the time I got here. Um, we started a project in the village of Adel on County Trunk A I believe that is. Yeah, I think so. Um, that we had to pull out of. We started the construction and we got to the middle of the job and we had some utility conflicts. So that was one that was ripped up for a while and, and uh, so we're going to go back and, and complete that in 2007. Um, we also had, uh, I got to look at my notes here a little bit, um, County Trunk C, Eastern Avenue in the city of Plymouth. Um, it was a short stretch, but it was still very uh, time consuming and kind of a pain for the people that lived out there. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, those are a couple of the major big ones. And we did, we paved about 15 miles of overlay this year and did about 12 miles of seal coating. And Bill asked a moment ago, well, if you have an average snowfall of one to two inches, you mentioned you're looking at a cost of probably a minimum of $60,000, which again, people can get appreciation for just what it takes to get that work done out there. What's a general rule of thumb that if you do a mile of roadway, whether it's, you know, overlay or, you know, a general, you know, if someone's wondering, well, what's it cost to do one mile of overlay? What's a general rule of thumb there? A complete reconstruction would be a million dollars a mile. That would be from start to finish. Um, an overlay runs anywhere between, uh, depending upon what the shape of the road was when you started, because a lot of times we'll go in and we'll do some patching prior to the overlay so that we get a nice smooth ride and bring the road back into shape. It could range anywhere from 50 to 75,000. Um, you got to add shouldering on, which could, you know, entail another five to six thousand dollars. So it's, it's um, you know, anywhere from sixty to a hundred thousand dollars in order to do that. A seal coating runs about ten thousand dollars a mile. Seal coating, if you don't know, it's a it's an application that we make. Uh, we spray down some oil and add in some chips or some slag, boiler slag from a area, um, he, uh, 
heating plant here and uh, give the asphalt a fresh coat to this and it helps preserve the pavement. So if someone has some seal coat go by their, their county road or town road, and a mile of that may be anywhere up to $100,000 and if someone's having a complete reconstruction done where you rip it out and, and completely redo it, you're looking at a million dollars a mile. Yep. Adds up in a hurry. Yes, it does. You know, fortunately for us, we've uh, um, my predecessor, Roger, had laid out some some very good funding avenues um, uh, into the future here, and hopefully they're still there when we get to the time to, to start building the roads again. And we do have some construction scheduled for 2007 here, and, and some of it is we're trying to figure out the schedules. County Trunk Old Superior Avenue was was going to get built in 2007, but due to some issues with the design review, uh, we're going to be held off. So we're looking at construction in 2008. Uh, which is going to entail a roundabout and, and some widening there and just to make traffic flow a lot better through that area. Between Wilgus Road and, and uh, 40th Street, we're looking at 14,000 cars in that corridor. So it's a, it's a very high traffic, uh, tri high volume area. So we'd like to, and it's growing so fast out there also that it's just going to add to the problem in the future. What else do you see coming up in 07? We have some... Um, the inner urban trail, the connection between the uh, Cedar Grove and, and um, Oostburg. We have uh, County Trunk PP um, by the city of Plymouth. We're uh, rebuilding from 57 to Willow Road. Um, there's numerous miles of overlay that we're doing. I think we're looking at 20 miles projected this year, which is an increase from last year. Uh, and that's going to depend. Earlier, you asked about oil prices. That we're gonna, we just uh, are in the process of bidding those out. So that's going to establish our price for, for 2007 for what we're going to be able to do for, for um, asphalting. Um, <clears throat> we have just various little betterment jobs for different townships that are coming in now, and, and we'll continue to do those. Betterment is, is working inside the existing right of way and cleaning up the ditches and, and making sure the drainage is flowing. Usually, when I do that, a year prior to asphalting the road, and that's kind of how the progression is. And, and I got to commend the, the uh, Sheboygan County and the entire local uh, units of government. They do a very good job at the betterment and getting the roads back into shape, and, and uh, uh, we're glad to be a part of that. And you have a what five to ten year plan, do you not? That kind of schedules when these roads need to be overlaid or maintained, how, how does that work? We like to get out of our surfaces anywhere from 10 to 15 years. On that overlay, we want to get 10 to 15 years. Normally, we're trying to get, uh, and that's prior to the uh, doing a seal code. Some of the stuff that's going on now is, is um, the oil companies are saying we should maybe seal coat a little earlier to preserve that pavement before it breaks down. And preserving it means that a lot of times the stones that are in there will start to pop loose and you want to do it before that starts to happen so that we don't, you don't lose the integrity of the road. Um, as far as the, the, uh, the plan for the future, I haven't quite got to that pile yet of, uh, <laughs> of stuff, but I, I know there is some stuff on the on the on the pan that we're looking at for the future, and, and we'll continue to look into that. Well, you've gotten through most of this program with only looking at your notes <laughs> once, so I'm very impressed, <laughs> Greg. So, very, you, you mentioned roundabouts, and we only have a couple of minutes left, but roundabouts of late in the county have been getting a little more attention in the paper and with some of the different projects, whether it's local or state. What's your opinion on round, roundabouts from a standpoint of traffic flow and safety? Well, you know, as I stated before, not every intersection is slated for a roundabout. You know, you have to have um, continuous problems, and, and continuous problems mean is if there is a history of accidents and, and different things like that, um, or if there's that potential. And every intersection has a potential of in, uh, accidents, but some are worse than others. Um, and I'll go back to the example of the 40th and, and Wilgus. You have a five-legged intersection, which is very difficult to that you wouldn't have to be able, you couldn't even light it. Uh, efficiently you know, as far as having traffic signals there. So a roundabout in that situation, due to the amount of traffic and the amount of congestion due to the stop, you know, at certain peak times of the day, there's backs up of traffic that goes quite a ways. Uh, so in, in that type of environment, a roundabout is going to be a, a very safe and efficient way of moving traffic without having to stop, basically, or, you know, you yield to your people, but very few, very few times you have to stop. So it keeps traffic flowing. And if there is an accident in that roundabout, it happens at a very low speed, 15, 20 miles an hour. So they prove to be very safe in that. Whereas if the intersection is left the way it is, you have uh, possibility of T-bone accidents where there's a lot more 
uh, personal injury type uh, incidents. You blow through a stop sign or a stop light at a higher rate of speed versus that slower yet but ongoing traffic and a roundabout, real big difference in the in the type of accident you're That's gonna experience. Correct. Yes, it is. Personally, the little that I've been on roundabouts, but generally that first impression is well you're it's kind of awkward at first because yep. we just don't we haven't we don't have a lot of experience with them, but it seems to me, at least to my impression, that once you've driven it once or twice, after a while you begin to appreciate it because you're not stopping for the light, you're not stopping for the stop sign. Uh, depending on the roundabout and sure. the, the yield signs, but usually it seems to keep traffic going pretty well. From what I've been understanding, and, and there must have been a fair amount of um, disregard for the one that was going to happen down at 32 and 28, and the people that are that that were not happy with it at first are happy with it now. It mm -hmm. seems to keep things going and flowing. Um, a lot of people are comparing the downtown rotary to a roundabout, and there's a little different style and a little different setup. They're easier to maneuver through. A roundabout's easier to maneuver through than the, than the rotary that's that's currently downtown. So the the comparison shouldn't, you know, be that way. Also, there's going to be uh, five roundabouts going in in Sheboygan County on State Highway 42 between Howard's Grove and um, Sheboygan or over by the Menards and the new Walmart that's proposed that's going to be going over there. So. It's not going to be something that's going to be new for Sheboygan County anymore. It's going to be it's going to be here to stay. It's uh, I, I think they're a good way of, of moving traffic, but again, not every intersection is designed for a roundabout. It sounds like the Department of Transportation, though the State Department of Transportation, is definitely taking um, as accepted a policy or is now promoting roundabouts far more than they did certainly 10 years ago. Yes, they are, and it, what's driving it is that there's some uh, Brown County has put in a lot of them. And uh, they feel that they've they've been accepted in that community, and people are really getting used to them. It's a change from what we're used to. Um, the uh, with the DOT, I mean, we just can't um, slap in roundabouts wherever we want. We have to go through a design, and that's a uh, design review through the DOT, and that's one of the things that held up our project. We wanted to make sure that it was the correct fit for the project, and and, and we we've gotten that back now. And they said this is a this meets the criteria for a roundabout. Well, Greg, we appreciate you joining us today and obviously covering a lot of ground from A to Z on the high-end overview of the highway operations, and it's a pleasure to have you aboard. As Greg mentioned earlier, he, he uh, uh, filled the shoes of a, a very successful predecessor, Roger Lanning, who retired here last year, and uh, we knew we had big shoes to fill, and Greg has come in and just hit the ground running, and I've heard nothing but positive things about you from your staff. and and board members, and it's just a pleasure to have you with us in Sheboygan County. I appreciate being here. I thank you for the opportunity to give me the job and, and this interview. Next month, we'll have our Interim Planning Director, Sean uh, Wiesner here, as well as Dirk Zeilman, who is the Chair of the Non-Motorized Transportation Program that uh, Greg referred to. ...dollars to spend throughout Sheboygan County to improve our transportation system and Dirk Seilman as well as the project manager Mary Ebeling will be here to talk about that program and give a status report. So until next month, thank you for joining us.